Manhattan Neighborhood Network, in partnership with the League of Women Voters of New York, the Amsterdam News, and Gotham Gazette, is pleased to bring you a debate among candidates running to fill the seat in City Council District No. 9. I'm Eleanor Tatum, publisher and editor-in-chief of the New York Amsterdam News. The New York City primaries will be held on Tuesday, September 12th for offices from mayor through city council. The winners of the primaries, like this one in Council District 9, will be the Democratic nominees in November's general election. With approximately 160,000 residents, District 9 represents West Harlem, Hamilton Heights, Manhattanville, and Morningside Heights. We ask the candidates able to join us today to keep their responses to a minute and any rebuttals they have to 30 seconds. The candidates are seated by random drawing. Starting from my left, we have Marvin Holland, Cordell Clear, Bill Perkins, Tyson Lord Gray, and Julius Tajadin. Welcome candidates and thank you for being here today. My first question goes to Julius Tajadin. What are your specific qualifications to represent and serve this community in the City Council for District 9? Well, I've been very involved um, for many years, over, six, uh, over 16 years in Harlem. And um, I've been involved in, um, with the community boards of Harlem, Community Board 10, Community Board 9, and a little bit of Community Board 11. And many issues that uh, have come to the community uh, I learned how to, um, to deal with these problems, you know, by being actively involved in the community boards. I served on different committees. Uh, I was appointed to various committees, such as housing, land use, education, and libraries, um, you name it. And um, I've been effective. So uh, my results have made me believe that I can, you know, do further as a city council person. Thank you. Um, Mr. Tyson, Lord Gray, same question. Um, thank you. And um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, good morning to you, Eleanor, and thank you um, to MNN for the opportunity to be here and a part of the conversation this morning. Um, so to answer the question, um, I have a wealth of experience that I bring um, to the table over 20 years of activism and work in the community. Um, I volunteer with several organizations in Harlem, um, Harlem Grown, um, we act, um, various um, nonprofits that are doing um, work in the community. Um, I'm also a professor at NYU and at Pace University um, in environmental studies and sciences. So I bring um, a level of expertise in environmental issues and environmental concerns that definitely affect Harlem residents. We understand that oftentimes low income communities are disproportionately affected by environmental risk and environmental burdens. Um, in addition to that, I uh, have a nonprofit organization that I founded myself, Green Community Vision. We do workshops in the community as well as conferences and partner with nonprofit faith based organizations. And so I've been extremely um, entrenched in the community and doing work in the community in various capacities over the last years. And so now I'm bringing that experience and that um, skill set into this, in this, this, this particular space. And Mr. Perkins. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank you and, and uh, MNNN for this opportunity for us to uh, share our candidacy for the city council. And um, I'm honored to be amongst these other candidates who I more or less know by virtue of the work that they've done in the neighborhood. My candidacy, I believe, is formidable by virtue of the track record that we've been able to establish in the neighborhood as a member of the city council. And, presently as well as in the past, as well as the opportunities I've been able to serve the neighborhood on a state level as well as a state senator. So I've returned to the council because having seen both avenues of opportunity to serve, I realized that the one that provides the most opportunity to take care of the needs of the neighborhood and provide the kind of accessibility that the neighborhood would like of an elected official is, work, is working on the local level. So I've returned uh, to continue working in the city council in terms of legislation, in terms of accessibility, and I look forward to this discussion uh, on our merits and our vision uh, for our community. Thank you. Cordell Clear? Yes, good morning. Thank you, Eleanor, for having this. Um, what best prepares me for this job is the fact that I am a lifelong resident of Harlem. 
I am someone who has lived, worshipped, raised a family during a period when it wasn't so attractive to be in this community. And in that time, I had uh, a child affected by the devastating effects of lead poisoning and was able to work with uh, a coalition of people citywide in Harlem and around New York City and even nationally to fight for better protections for our children. And in that experience, I also was able to work for the former council member and former state senator and hear even more concerns and fight for even more change in my community. I think my best preparation is the fact that I was raised and groomed by the people of Harlem who always were never shy to tell me what was wrong, what was needed, and I got the opportunity through working in that office to help bring results for them and was effective in doing that. Thank you. Mr. Marvin Holland. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me here this morning at MM Network. Uh, what makes me qualified for this position is at my core for the last 27 years I've been a transit worker. And so I know every day working families problems. But for the past seven years I've been the political director of the Transport Workers Union, the largest trans transit union in the country with 42,000 members. And I've learned how to make politics work for my membership. I would like to bring that to Harlem. Every year that I was Working in Albany, I was able to pass legislation even in the dysfunction that, that is Albany. Therefore, I would like to bring those skills to Harlem. What's needed to get things done is the ability to build coalitions and work across lines with other people. I've done that for my career and since I've been in politics, and I'll bring that same experience to Harlem. Uniting the community is the number one thing I feel that's needed in Harlem as the, the community is broken politically and the community is not working together. There's an enormous amount of talent in Harlem, but we need to bring it together and get everybody on the same page and working towards the same goals. I can bring those things to Harlem, and I've done that in my entire career, standing up to the powers to be, and Harlem needs to have someone that's going to fight for it. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, what do you consider the most pressing needs of District 9? And what would be your first order of business if elected? Let's uh, start with Tyson Lord Gray. Thank you. So I think that the most pressing issue that we're facing in um, New York City really as a whole is affordable housing. Um, specifically though in District 9, we are the second highest rent increase in the last decade in New York City. So a lot of our um, constituents are being pushed out and being priced out. Um, individuals are unable to find affordable housing. And so that would be my number one priority, would be to, one, um, preserve the housing that we currently have. So we know that um, over half of all New York renters are a part of the rent stabilization program. And so making sure that that program is, um, has the proper safeguards and that individuals are not being um, evicted. Um, over 30% of the evictions that happened last year were um, individuals who were a part of that program. When I was working with Legal Aid Society, I was a part of um, the Tenants' Right Project, which actually worked with individuals who had been evicted um, wrongly by landlords to get them back into their um, housing, to get those units back under the rent stabilization program, um, and to get them money that they had perhaps overpaid. Um, and then the other thing I would want to do is work with um, other city council members and the mayor to help create new housing opportunities for individuals. All right. Mr. Perkins, the most pressing needs of the community? I hesitate to uh, describe the most pressing need because, frankly, there are many pressing needs, uh, none of which are second to the other. So the question of affordability has already been raised, and I'm, and I'm in support of the need for more affordable housing, not defined by measures that we presently use, but more importantly defined by what's in people's pockets. Often we use the term affordability, like beauty, it's in, the eye, it's in the eye of the beholder. Affordability is in the pocket of the constituency that I represent. So, so often our measures of affordability don't meet that need. So towards that end, we're going to need to provide more subsidies, more kinds of funding for folks that don't measure up in terms of what's in their pocket to what it costs to actually live in our neighborhood. And so we get this term called gentrification that is sort of a term that many people in the community are concerned about because it means that they're going to be excluded. So that is one of the pressing needs, but I also understand the value of public education and the shortcomings that we have presently 
from that point of view. I don't subscribe to some of the gimmicks that we've been using, so to speak, to address that need because they haven't measured up either. Education, Public education is, is, is a very, morning. very important priority of mine. Okay. Um, does anyone have another pressing need besides education and, um, and housing that they think is paramount in uh, this district? Yeah I, yeah, I think it's paramount that we support small businesses and the ability for people to start small businesses. With unemployment where it is, it is really necessary for people to make their own jobs and it is difficult to uh, afford space, not just for housing, but for commercial as well. And even some of our small businesses right now are struggling to stay above board because it has become, again, so attractive to be in the community and there's so much competition. We have large name brand stores uh, coming to Harlem and the mom and pop community owned businesses that I grew up with, uh, you know, the Copelands, the Wilsons, the Wellses, uh, the Georgies, the family businesses, the Better Crust, the other businesses, people who want to start those businesses now are finding it very difficult to do so. I think that we have to preserve the opportunity for new business growth in Harlem. All right, so I'm going to throw this out to everyone. How do we preserve the new business growth in Harlem? You again. I, I think one of the things that we have to do is there has to be some form of commercial uh, rent control. We have to figure out how to have rent control for commercial units. We have to promote more incubator programs uh, for people who are starting businesses uh, from the ground up. A lot of our people, they're very talented. They're entrepreneurs. Uh, but the business aspect, the technical aspect of it, they need support. They need help. And government can do that. We can uh, create more opportunities for, for mothers and, 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 and women who want to start businesses in our community. And I'd like to. Uh, as a city council person, increase initiatives and dollars in that area to make sure that we can do that. Mr. Ta uh, Tajadin? Yes. Uh, when new businesses or projects come into the community, whether they be from the city or private, we have to tie them into the community sector. So, for example, um, a developer comes to the community, you know, trying to get more bulk and density or a free lot or whatever, and we don't have a tie-in uh, that can benefit us economically. Now, we somewhat succeeded in doing this with the Columbia Expansion Plan. Uh, Columbia, they expanded into Manhattanville, and we do have some of that commercial space uh, on that site that will be uh, designated for businesses that are on a certain standard. So we can do this across the board. Uh, we have to write rewrite the narratives on some of these things. You know, we're still listening to the same type of talk that doesn't serve us well. So we have to rewrite what's really in our interest. This is what, if you're coming to us, the city or a private um, entity, this is what you're gonna have to do. You, we have to tie in what's in our interest with these projects. All right, thank you. Mr. Holland, constituent services are a main function of um, a council members' office. Um, given that we have these pressing needs of housing, education, small business, and a myriad of others, uh, what services do you envision to be the most needed, and, and how will you effectively provide those services? What I would do is take the council office into the community. A lot of times the community doesn't actually know what the office of the city council can do. Uh, so. I would have several days a week where I go into the community and actually have my office in the community, where, where, whether it's in the polo grounds or Taft housing, wherever the, the needs are needed, I'll bring it into the community. The other thing I want to do is put together an advisory council of community leaders of all ages to talk about what the real issues and problems are in Harlem and work together with the community, have the community governing uh, the, the community. Lastly, I would bring, one of the big things I would bring into Harlem is participatory budgeting. Giving the community a chance on how they're going to use the budgeting process and the money and the resources is very important in Harlem. All right, yes, participatory budgeting is something I was going to get into a little bit later, but since it's been brought up now, I'd like to know all of your feelings on participatory budgeting and uh, would you all, um, if elected, 
participate in the use of participatory budgeting. Yeah, I, I subscribe thoroughly to that and actually had the opportunity to participate in it in the past and I think it does democratize the process in such a way that it informs the community about what we are trying to do and what they would like to see done <coughs> and opens the door of opportunity for their vision or their ideas uh, to be a part of that ultimate budget. Um, generally speaking, uh, the community does not have that type of engagement and very often it's left to those of us who are on the insiders to make those kind of decisions whether in one legislative body or another. But um, that opportunity to get folks involved and engaged in the process with their ideas and with their debate about what they would like to see, uh, whether it's all accepted or not, it nevertheless gives them the opportunity to feel that they're relevant and that the process is directed towards their needs. Ms. Clear? I would absolutely engage in participatory budget uh, program. You know, over the years, again, my experience taught me uh, working in an elected official's office, it is such a tough decision. There are so many needs in the community and there are so many great organizations and service agencies worthy of it. I think that it is, it is a good opportunity for everyone to sit down and just uh, come up with the best possible scenario at the end of the day and, and be involved in actually what services hit our community or what, ser what services are funded by the discretionary funding that most of them are very worthy of receiving. All right, Mr. Gray. And I would just like to point out that the, um, the funds, the half million to a million dollars in discretionary funds is actually taxpayer money. So um, the fact that taxpayers should be able to be a part of the process of redirecting and reinvesting those funds back into the community um, really should be self-intuitive. Um, unfortunately, however, District 9 is not a part of that program currently, so perhaps Councilman Perkins can um, elaborate a little bit on that because we don't currently participate in that program. Would you like to respond, Mr. Well, we've, that program uh, was born during uh, the period when I was in the council, and whenever the opportunity came to do it, uh, we've done it. So I don't quite understand what he's alleging because the record speaks for itself. All right, Mr. Uh, Tajuddin. Participatory budgeting, um, the concept itself uh, is engaging with the community on how your money is going to be spent. And so um, whether you give it a title of that or another title, but I'd like to say that Community Board 9, um, when we struck a community benefits agreement between Columbia University and Manhattanville, uh, in essence, that's what we're doing. We are participating in a great way uh, on how this money, this benefit money is going to be spent. And so sometimes we need to borrow ideas from other uh, community boards and see what they're doing. But uh, we've attempted to do this in uh, Council District 9, and if for some reason it doesn't get off the ground, and that's kind of um, the leadership to some degree may not be on a city council level. It could even be community board level. You just need very proactive people <clears throat> that can get things done. And I feel that um, over the time I've been very proactive, and I could be proactive in this regard as well. Thank you very much. Can I just clarify real quick? You are speaking about the participatory budgeting program that council members sign up for and then their districts vote on the spending of the yes. million dollars discretionary funding. Yes. Okay. All right. Now we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, you know, currently the mayor has called for a 90-day review of all the statues and monuments that in any way may suggest hate or division or racism anti or anti-Semitism. Do you support the removal of controversial figures from city parks or public areas? Mr. Tajardin. You know, that's a very slippery slope because um, in Brooklyn, for example, uh, the residents there wanted to name Gates Avenue after Sonny Abudika Carson. And there was resistance, you know, to that being done by uh, members in the city council. Sonny Carson, in my view, um, was an American hero. So I think if we start, um, we have to really examine, do we want to really do this? Because, you know, I would hate for someone to tell me that Malcolm X, his statue has to come down because he, uh, you know, supported hate or whatever, and you don't really understand where he was coming from. So you're going to find the people who are pushing this, their leaders 
and images of their leaders and so forth might be attacked too. So, you know, it's, it has to be really examined. We shouldn't rush into this uh, because I wouldn't want, you know, my leaders to be attacked. Mr. Gray? So I think the benefit of a democracy is that you have engagement and you have transparency and you have openness and you have conversations. Um, and so I am completely behind the process of reviewing. Um, I think that it is a healthy process to really um, ask the question, right? Why is this statue here? What does it symbolize? How are people affected by it um, mentally, physically? Um, you know, what is their emotional response and reaction to those particular figures and um, individuals and, and those who want it? Um, what does it mean for them, right? And I think that that conversation can only help us understand um, each other better and have open dialogue. So I'm in support. Mr. Perkins. Generally speaking, you know, we put statues up as some sort of role model, some sort of uh, example of someone that may have done something good and contributed to the well-being of our society, generally speaking. However, uh, historically, we come from uh, era of racism and sexism and all those other kinds of uh, isms that denigrate our humanity and, and, and don't really represent the vision of our community that we intend to have, especially in contemporary times. Because upon review, there are statues out there that have no business being promoted as role models for good behavior or as examples of what's great about this city or about this country. So we need to review all of that and we need to recognize where there may have been prejudicial, even racist or sexist or homophobic or whatever you want to decide, uh, individuals who have been put up as heroes that are offensive uh, to the community. So I have no problem reviewing it and making decisions about whether or not those statues should be remain or whether or not, if they remain, their bad behavior, if there is such, is included so that the, there's no misunderstanding that that individual is someone that should be exemplified. Ms. Clare. I completely support a review of the statues and images that we're taught to emulate and that are there for the public to praise. Uh, there are people who are not worthy of our praise. Their actions are horrific uh, to some, some people, some of us. And I think that the community evolves and it grows and it changes. And I think that we are at a point where we do need to look at these images. There are, there, there are there, I mean, just gender equity in terms of who we even create statues for. Um, you know, all these things have to be looked at. So yes, I support a review of the statues and I think we just all have to be vigilant and be at the table and let our voices be heard in support or in, in not support. Thank you. Mr. Holland. Yes, I absolutely uh, agree with the reviewing um, and looking at which statues we may need to remove uh, from around the city. Uh, in addition to that, though, I think we have to take a close look at remarks people are making at this time. The fact that Dan Lowe made those racist remarks and we haven't really taken a look at it and he's still sitting at the head of Success Academy. And so as we're removing these statues and we're reviewing to remove these statues, I think this is a teachable moment in, in our time and in our history so people can understand the real history of how and who some of these people are in these statues. If we're not going to teach and educate why we're doing this review process, then I think we're just doing a process that's a political act. But I think we should be adding something to our education system talking about why we're removing these statues, particularly in a place like Harlem. Thank you. Now, as representatives for your district, what do you believe your role is to discourage discrimination against marginalized communities such as immigrants, Muslims, LGBTQ individuals, and people of color? Marvin Hong, let's start with you again. Uh, that is a big role of the council person. When I leave here this morning, I'm going down to a rally for uh, an immigrant, uh, a teamster who was uh, being deported from the country. Uh, I have the support of a lot of people in the immigrant community because I've been fighting around these issues for a long time, as well as the LBGQ uh, community. Uh, my son was a gay male and went to a black college and, and, and suffered a lot of abuse while he was in school. So I understand these issues from a personal perspective. So the, the role of the council person is to take a lead on these issues 
and be a, sort of the, the sounding board, the person who's out in front, the person with the uh, blowhorn, the speaker that's talking about these issues and what's happening in the community around it, these issues. Ms. Claire. Certainly we should be highlighting uh, any form of injustice, uh, whether it's immigrants, no matter what it is, we should be highlighting that. But education is very important as well, uh, and at a young age. Uh, and for all, all children, you know, right now in our schools, we're not teaching about black history, which is a large part of American history. It is American history. You have to be taught about immigrants. We need to know who we each other are. And I think that that starts at a young age and it starts with education. It also starts with services that have to be available for people so they don't feel like they have to live in the shadows. All of us have to be understanding of this. I too have done extensive amount of work around immigrants <laughs> and immigration and uh, making sure that people understand uh, that everyone has the right to be here and everyone can be here. So we do have to, as a, as a council person, we have to make sure that we take the lead, that we represent the image that we want people to follow and be inclusive and responsive to all. Thank you. Mr. Perkins. I, I hear you with uh, what my colleagues are saying and my track record reflects our deep involvement with these immigrant issues and making sure that uh, my office can be supportive or whatever other entities that we can bring to bear uh, on, on their behalf is made available to them. I think it's a very uh, interesting issue because this is an immigrant born city <laughs> and uh, that legacy uh, is what to some extent makes this such a great city and uh, it has a, a responsibility uh, to pay tribute to that by making sure that those doors that were open are not closed to anyone that wants to come again. So we're very much in support of that and that's a very significant part of our agenda. We're so happy for instance that we've seen so many folks coming uh, from West Africa into our city and into our community and getting involved uh, in civics and in the public school systems, so on and so forth. So New York has, has been a treasure of uh, opportunity uh, for that kind of perspective and I look forward to continuing to, to reinforce it and to uh, enable others to come as well. Come one, come all. Mr. Gray? Um, so I would echo um, all of those on the stage. Um, and I would say in addition to the advocacy and um, that type of work that it's also the role of the city council to um, pass legislation and, and, and laws that are going to protect those who have been discriminated against from that discrimination. Um, and so um, getting rid of stop and frisk, which um, allows for um, the discrimination of black and brown um, bodies here in New York, right, in terms of the um, allocation of certain laws and rules. Um, also um, supporting um, legislation that would provide for sanctuary organizations to be able to continue to do that type of work. So we know earlier this year um, there was legislation passed that minimized the um, requirements of New York City to comply with some of the federal laws coming down from ICE in terms of gathering information um, on immigrants and things of that caliber. So I think it's important for City Council to be an advocate both in the streets but also in the chambers and making sure that laws reflect um, the diversity of New York City and protects everyone that contributes to this great city. Mr. Tajadine? Yes, we do have the ability to unite while still respecting each other's unique differences. Um, a lot of times it's the example that you live. So uh, as a city council person, um, and I am one that's very much in the community and I'm, I walk all over, uh, when people see your example and they see that you're not discriminating against different groups, and sometimes you come, uh, you encounter with people who will try to insinuate some type of discrimination. And so when they see that you're resisting that, it, you know, you lead by example. But uh, I just wanted to address the stop and frisk uh, situation. Um, I helped the NYPD form this neighborhood um, community policing program. And in the districts where this program is being implemented, stop and frisk has basically stopped. So we have in the 2-8th, it's almost non-existent. In the 32nd, it's non-existent. And so um, it's just a person... Um, Sometimes you don't wait for someone to give you an assignment. You just take the lead. 
Thank you. Now, so, several of you brought up um, police in, uh, during this last question. And, uh, you know, over the last few weeks and months, discussion about police community of relations has really dropped off the radar with more talk about national issues and of Donald Trump and what that means to all of us and uh, and the issues that are affecting us with discrimination more on a national level and on immigration and whatnot. But what is happening with police and community relations in the district and does it still need improvement and how would you help to improve police community relations in the district? Let's start with Mr. Perkins. Well, you know, um, Trumpism is not, you know, is, is not new to us. And in fact, uh, when you talk about police community relations, uh, Donald Trump's presence when he was uh, so visible in New York City aggravated that. And now he's our president. So I want to make sure that we don't forget who this person is as we've come to know him in the, in the era of the Central Park Five when five young people from our neighborhood uh, were... Uh, accused of a rape that they did not commit, but nevertheless, Donald Trump called for the return of the death penalty. That's the mentality of that Trumpism that we know and we must never forget. And I think that uh, clearly uh, how we handle these local issues, uh, especially around uh, policing and uh, especially around how our young people are treated in, in, in the public arena uh, is, is very critical and still in need of reform and in, in, and in need of some vigilance on our part to make sure that they don't get subject to uh, being accused of crimes that they didn't commit. Mr. Holland? I think there's always room for improvement on uh, police relations. Uh, I do think that relations are rather well in Harlem as a whole as the precincts are really trying to work and the police are working with the community. I think there needs to be more community policing uh, I was in uh, talking to Miss Henry and Taft houses, and she, which one of the things she was saying was, I would like to see the uh, patrols come back through the buildings like they were doing in the past and walk through the gardens of the, and the properties of the building. I also think that we need to take a look at who we're sending into our community as police officers. And one of the ideas that came up from one of, one of the, uh, while out on the campaign was, Perhaps the officers, before they come into the community or why they're in training, need to spend a few, hour, a few weeks in our community as part of their training so they can get to know the community. Instead of people just being put into our community as police officers, they need to get to know the community a little better. I think it's happening, but I think we need more of that. More, the, the, lastly, I would like to close with violence. Uh, crime is way down in New York, and all the credit is being given to the police, and they deserve a great deal of credit. But what it's not talking is to the frontline people who are working in the Cure Violence programs to bring these down. So they need more resources. And the one big thing we need is more jobs in the community for people. Thank you. Ms. Clear. I think perception is a big a factor, the perception of law enforcement in communities uh, when you're talking about community police relationships. And when you have these big issues, uh, national issues uh, that develop in our cities and across the country, there has to be justice. If I commit a murder, I need to be dealt with. I need to go to jail. And I think too often, recently, we're looking at these high profile cases where p black men, in particular, have been murdered and there are no ramifications. No one goes to jail. And I think that resonates with people in our communities locally who see themselves as, as Philando Castile, who see themselves as Eric Garner, who see themselves as Mike Brown, who see themselves as these people that these things are happening to. So I think we have to deal with that. Um, we also have to deal with, very simply, on a local level, you know, I've been attending a lot of block parties in the community, which is one of uh, the greatest tools we have to build community. And many of them have complained about getting resistance from the local precincts to put these block parties together. I think this is an opportunity that our police can take advantage of. I think we should have block parties. Black parties are not the cause of problems. Uh, they're actually a great place where people come together and, and enjoy each other and come to know each other and the police have an opportunity to engage there as well. Thank you. Mr. Tajuddin? Yes. Um, so I, I am happy to say that I did help uh, create 
the neighborhood coordinating officer community policing program that's now citywide. And, you know, that gives me a different perspective because I'm very engaged still uh, with the program and, and its development and so forth. But a lot of times um, people don't fully understand that community policing also means that the citizen has to really police whatever's going on. So if you're going to give a block party, then it's your job to basically police that block party. If you let it get out of hand, if you let infiltrators come in or interlopers come into your, into your block party and start trouble, now when it falls apart, you want to blame the police. So in uh, Precinct 28 in Harlem, uh, we have an opportunity to really engage in how we're going to police our neighborhoods. Uh, you could call Inspector Christoph McIntosh, and he welcomes any ideas uh, from the community. And we just uh, collaborated on something to get rid of a problem on 125th Street uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it, uh, we don't have to tell people what we did, but we successfully got rid of that problem by community engagement. All right. Mr. Gray. Um, I would say that there's some problems that we have to sit down and brainstorm and come up with solutions for, and then there are other problems where I feel like the blueprint is already there. So we recently had the passage of the Community Safety Act that um, provides more transparency for police actions. Um, it um, calls for an um, external review force that looks at police actions. Um, also, we know that um, they have the National Night Out and they have programs that are already implemented that facilitate the type of community um, policing that we want and we have legislation that um, helps to minimize and, and um, alleviate some of the issues that, that are concerns. And so it's really just a matter of a city council person advocating for the community, pushing these particular um, pieces of legislation that are already in place, um, holding the mayor accountable to his promise to have body cameras on all police um, within the next um, year or two. And so um, I think it's just a matter of doing that work and keeping, to, keeping that conversation going. Ms. Clear, did you have something to add? Just that in Harlem in particular, you know, there's another concern that I run into all the time, and there has to be trust between the police and the residents of the community and the existing residents. Uh, gentrification has causing, caused some uh, tensions between residents who have expressed that they feel that the police protect or come to serve just one group of people. So we really have to look at those little small details, which are not so small, and we have to make sure everybody feels that they're a part of that community and a part of the policing. All right, thank you. Now, you know, an issue that still plagues our communities is, is youth violence and also summer youth programs for jobs. Um, so that goes into budgeting, that goes into summer youth employment, and that goes into violence. How do they all play in together and how do we resolve these issues and, and, and what are your ideas? Um, let's start with uh, Mr. Holland. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to do this summer, but we weren't able to do, hopefully we would be able to do it next summer, was to have a camp. Uh, we have some property upstate, uh, one of the church's owns, and we wanted to take some of the uh, kids out of the neighborhood, some of the most dangerous youth who uh, we know who they are. I work with a, a lot of them. And so we wanted to have this camp where they can go up and learn a skilled trade over the summer with the building trade unions. So hopefully we'll have this in place next year. As I said earlier, what people want are jobs and they want good quality jobs. So if we're not working towards bringing good quality jobs to Harlem, then none of this is, all of, the, all of this work is gonna be in vain. I, I talk to almost every day uh, people about youth violence and, and, and I spend a lot of my time dealing with this population. And they, it comes back to the same things. We got to find em employment. All right, Mr. Gray. So I actually agree with that um, fundamental premise that we have to provide um, jobs for individuals so that they have something to work forward um, to and they have something to invest in. Um, fortunately, we do have programs in Harlem already, individuals who are working on job training and who are attempting to do that type of work. Um, and oftentimes they just don't have the support from um, the government, they don't have the funding um, to help those programs become more viable. Um, we know that um, the Adult Learning Center um, in Harlem has a program that um, helps teach um, HVAC trade 
and the program was not able to run because they weren't able to find a professor. It's a free program paid for by the city, but they weren't able to find a professor for that program. And so having the infrastructure and having individuals in place to help um, those who are already doing that type of work, and then also creating jobs. So I think that we can create green jobs in Harlem. There's no reason that we don't have a microgrid. There's no reason we're not installing solar panels. There's no reason that we're not um, creating opportunities for individuals to learn skills and apply them right there at home and benefit Harlem. Mr. Tajardin? Well, I'm a product of the Job Corps. And um, the way Job Corps operated some years back, many of um, the people that went to Job Corps were sort of forced to go to Job Corps. So they had an opportunity to either go to Job Corps uh, in a more structured you know, facility or go to jail. Um, I came up with an idea a while back called Probation Plus. And you make the, um, the parent and the, uh, the child that's facing um, you know, charges, uh, you have to go to some type of camp. So I like uh, Mr. Holland's idea about having a camp, but some, we can sort of like maybe twist the arm of that individual to make that person go to camp. And um, when I went to Job Corps, you know, it was a very rewarding experience. So it's uh, once you get them out of this environment, they can change. And that's the whole thing, getting them out of this environment to let them see another part of life. Um, so that's kind of like my vision. And I think I could do that legislatively. Mr. Perkins? Uh, you know, we um, historically in this city have had a, uh, a vision of uh, making sure that young people uh, were given opportunities for making some money legally, uh, summer jobs, uh, summer youth programs that, that engage them with sometimes the corporate sector, business sector. And I think that we need to go back, to go forward in terms of making sure that as we do our council work, as we do our city budget work, that there are priorities representing the needs of young people in terms of employment opportunities as well as other kinds of opportunities. So I think that there's an urgency to that because I don't think that the Young people today feel the same sense of uh, commitment on the part of government in terms of making sure that they have employment opportunities available to them. Yeah, Ms. Clare. I agree with all that was said about uh, employment opportunities, other opportunities uh, for young people to get away, but I would only add to that that we must increase entrepreneurial opportunities for our young people so that they can understand how they can take their talent and brand their product or their talent or whatever it is they have. We have a lot of artists, uh, fashion designers, uh, mu uh, musical artists and others uh, who just need that technical support and need the way to get there. And when you talk about gun violence, you have to talk about uh, our efforts to continue to get these guns off the streets and out of the hands of children. Um, they shouldn't be out here and we have to continue to do that nationally and locally. And in addition to that, we do have to make sure we support mental health services. Uh, a lot of this is, is stemming from uh, uh, people who need counseling um, and other, other types of supports and services that are not being provided. We have to support those organizations and make sure that uh, people are getting the help that they need. All right, thank you. Now, as more and more residential buildings are being built in the district and the population grows and a lot more families are moving into Harlem, as a council member, how do you plan to help prevent overcrowding in the schools? Let's start with Mr. Perkins. First, there's uh, no guarantee that uh, more uh, families moving in uh, are going to necessarily aggravate the uh, overcrowding per se because my observation is that uh, we're not having the size of families that we've had in the past, number one. Number two, um, I think that obviously if there is the need for more facilities, more buildings, then uh, through the council and through state government we should be able to get the resources to accommodate that need. Um, but I'm not 100% I'm not sure that uh, that need is being uh, um, aggravated uh, in a significant way by virtue of uh, uh, the population explosion that people claim is taking place, and, and it's particularly in terms of the numbers of young people that are education, public school education ready. 
All right, Mr. Holland. I, we have to look at the school system and, and, and just improve the school system overall. I think a lot of people are moving into Harlem, but they're not sending their, their children to school, certainly not to the local schools, because we still have the most segregated school system or the second most segregated school system in the country. So clearly these people are moving in, but they're not necessarily going to send their, school, their, their children to the district schools. One of the complaints I'm hearing from a lot of parents who've moved into Harlem is that they're thinking about moving out because they, they, they don't like the schools in Harlem, and so they can't afford to send their kids to private schools, so they're trying to figure out what to do with their children. So we have to fix the overall school system in Harlem, whether it's a charter school, district school, we have to focus on fixing the schools, and certainly we need to put some more schools in Harlem because the co-location situation is out of control where they're mingling and mixing different age groups of in students into schools, and that's not healthy. So we have to look at the, the school system holistically and fix both the district schools and the charter schools and make sure our school system is working. Mr. Tajadin? Well, there's a problem of, um, you know, systematically, uh, gentrification does mean pushing people out to bring a new gentry in. And so that even uh, falls onto a school. So I've been involved in different fights trying to keep schools open, which I, I've succeeded in doing that. But, you know, it's never like you can uh, put your feet up on a desk and relax and say you won the battle. You have to keep on uh, being dil diligent. So we have these... Um, you know, we face these scams where, you know, schools, our district schools, are being threatened with closure. Four, to make room for this new gentry. Um, that's a problem. It's not uh, so much overcrowded. It's overcrowded if you allow uh, just people just to come and there's no room for them. And then you try to push other people out. You build high. So you're trying to, you have to stop those things first. Stop those things and it won't really be a problem. But as long as they're just coming in with no way to, uh, to manage them, to move them around the city, and you're building high and you're not thinking about anything, then it becomes a problem. So it all works in together. Ms. Clare? I think that we have to address the quality of education in our schools overall. I don't think there is an overcrowding problem um, uh, in our schools, our traditional public schools. And one way to, if there is, to stop that is definitely to stop these co-locations where they continuously move uh, charter schools into buildings and disrupt what's going on there. We need to focus on bringing our schools up to a standard that every parent would want to send their child there. And that's what we have not dealt with. I'm not afraid. The only gentrification of, of schools that's happening right now to me is, is the charter school movement that has practically... Uh, housed itself in every single traditional public school in Harlem, uh, unlike any other neighborhood where this is not happening like that at that rate. There is a huge amount of charter schools and some buildings more than one in our, charter, in our, in our traditional public school buildings. I, like uh, was said earlier, I think that we need to bring a standard of education up for everyone. The gentry will want to go there. The residents will be happy to have their children there. We just have to keep fighting for better standards for everyone. And we have to get those CFE dollars. Mr. Gray? Um, so I'll say this, um, two things. Um, so we do know statistically that Harlem schools are overcrowded, overcrowded but they are less overcrowded than other schools. So um, th they're on the low end of being overcrowded. Um, I think that the um, entry of, of new um, individuals is only going to exacerbate that. Um, but the issue is less about the overcrowding and more about the fact that um, public schools specifically um, are tasked to teach all learning styles, ESLs, you name it. Um, and so oftentimes while smaller class sizes are helpful, um, it's the strategies that teachers are able to implement that really is going to make the difference. Um, and again, I'm talking, I went to public school, so I'm thinking specifically of public school. I taught in public school. We know that charters are able to select and deselect, but it's the public schools with the teachers who have five, six, seven different learning styles in one classroom that becomes a challenge. And we need to, one, invest in um, either new schools. We need to renovate the schools that we have so that the spaces are serving multiple purposes. Um, and then also we need to invest in the type of training that teachers are able to do their job more effectively.
Thank you. And then this is a question I'm just going to ask all of you. We're just going to go right down the line on this one. Um, where do you stand on mayoral control of the New York City public schools? Mr. Tajadin. Well, I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, I do think that um, community school boards should come back. I do believe in self-determination. Um, I think that um, the city's too large, really, for mayoral control. And if the communities kind of, um, the districts, govern themselves uh, somewhat, I mean, you do have, uh, you have to answer to someone, like the commissioner of education. But uh, I do believe in self-determination. And I think that uh, it would involve more stakeholders if you did it that way. Right now, the stakeholders, um, they're limited. It's too, um, you know, in the opposite direction. Mr. Gray? So um, I think this comes back to my fundamental view of democracy and engagement and participation. And so I think that um, neighborhoods, parents, um, communities should have a voice in the school systems and the school districts. And so I think that we should have school boards and um, not in favor of mayoral control. Mr. Perkins? I, th I've, I uh, think mayoral control has not proven itself. Um, and I think that um, what we've had in the past in terms of community participation, parent participation, has been uh, aggravated by this process and that uh, we need to go back to go forward in terms of providing more opportunity uh, for other types of participation that, that, does, that, that doesn't allow male control to turn out to be male dictatorship. Ms. Claire? I believe in the public's participation in public education. As someone who sat on a school board for eight years and the CEC for two years as the president of the CEC, I think that it was a much better thing when the communities and parents had the opportunity to have a bigger say in what happened to their children. Who better, who better than parents and grandparents and others in the community, the original stakeholders, to, to say what their children need, what their schools need, and to participate in governing the education system in the districts. Mr. Yeah, Holland. I have great problems with uh, mayor control. Uh, when the previous mayor was in office, that is when we were, all the charter schools were allowed to move into Harlem because of mayor control. And now we have this mayor and the, the, reason, the problem I have with mayor control is that it now makes education a, a, a political issue. So now you see the standards being lowered for teachers because a deal was made in Albany to allow this to happen for the charter schools, that they would lower the standards to, to, so they can continue and extend mayor control for two years. And so the problem with mayor control, in concept, it can be okay, but the way it's being done and used as a political tool for the charter schools and the district schools, I think is what's raising havoc on our schools, particularly in District 5 in Harlem and throughout District 9. All right, now we're gonna have a very quick lightning round. Yes or no answers only, please. Starting with Mr. Holland and going straight down the line. Do you support congestion pricing? Yes. 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 No. Have you served on a community board if yes, which one? Starting with Dr. Dean. Committees on the community boards, nine and community board 10. No. Yes. No. Served and appointed people to the community board. No. Yes, community board 11. Would you have town hall meetings if elected? Absolutely. Yes. As always. Most definitely. Yes, I've done them now, even not elected. Yes, I have. All right. On November 7th this year, every New Yorker will be asked to vote yes or no on a constitutional convention um, to amend New York State Constitution. If a voter asked you about this, what would you tell them and why? Which is not actually a yes or no question, but what do you, th would you vote for a constitutional convention? Don't Starting oh. with Mr. Tajani. Yes. Yes. Yes, because... I yes believe, or no question? Oh, yes. Then. Yes. No. Thank you very much. We are now going to go to the closing statements. Each candidate will have up to one minute, and we will start with you, Mr. Holland. Thank you again for having uh, me here today. I think the question we have to ask ourselves in this race is, can we make our Harlem a zone of opportunity? 
can we make Harlem where every, every family has a stake in their future? Can we make Harlem united again? And can we make Harlem a high-tech center? Can we achieve urban farming status in Harlem? My name is Marvin Holland, and I would like for the community to join me in my campaign. Vote for me on September 12th, a new day in Harlem politics. Thank you. Ms. Clare. As we welcome the new to Harlem, the new opportunities, the new people, I'm committed to not overlooking those who stayed in Harlem when it wasn't a good place to be, who fought to preserve it, who kept it, who fought for better things to come to the community. I want to recognize the fact that those people are still here and create opportunity for them to remain. I don't think they benefited as much as they should have. Uh, these are the people who held our community down, who made sure that we kept our buildings, who made sure that we kept our schools, and now it's almost like they are being punished, almost like we're saying, now we're finished with you and you're priced out and you can't stay here. And I think that's wrong and I don't think it's necessary. And at the same time, we can certainly have new people come. I would like to bring the perspective of a woman to this council seat. I am the only woman running. I'm the only woman up here. And I think that it is time. It is time for that change. A recent report uh, released by the City Council Women's Caucus uh, shows the declining number of women in the City Council and it's expected to go even lower in the upcoming election. I want to represent Harlem. I want to make sure everybody gets fed and I want to bring my skills that I've learned over the years to the table. Thank you. Mr. Perkins. Well, first I want to uh, thank you and, and my colleagues uh, on the dais for the opportunity to have a discussion about uh, the City Council and City Government. Uh, I want to thank my constituency for the years of support that you've given me to represent you. I look forward to the continuation of that support continuation of the agenda that we have uh, represented over the years in a successful way. Um, and I think that uh, this is a very important time for, the, for Harlem and for the communities like Harlem. And the kind of leadership that we have been able to provide, I think, uh, is strong enough uh, to help us not only sustain what we've done, but go even further in terms of addressing the immediate concerns of families in this community, especially when it comes to public education and especially when it comes to public transportation. We look forward to continuing to serve. Thank you very much for the opportunity to share. Thank you. Mr. Gray. Well, thank you again, um, Eleanor and MNN, for this opportunity to be a part of the discussion. Um, <clears throat> let me just say that I'm extremely um, grateful to just be able to run for this office. At, fundamentally, I am a Deweyan, so I believe in democracy. I believe that um, if we um, participate in this process, we can make this process work for us. And so I would simply ask everyone to um, please, please, please come out September 12th. So many people have um, paid for us to have the opportunity to be able to vote. And so to come out, make your voice heard, make your vote count. Um, and I often say the only thing better than a vote is an informed vote. And um, you don't have to have a PhD or a JD to be informed. You can walk outside and look around your neighborhood. You can look at businesses that have closed. You can um, look at your Con Ed bill or look at your lease agreement or look at um, you know your neighbors and, and the street corner and you can be informed and after that research um, if you decide that everything is great and you don't want changes then on September 12th you should vote for the status quo but if like me you think that Harlem can do better I ask that you would vote for change vote for the first name on the ballot Tyson Lord Gray help me make Harlem better for those that live here and stronger for generations to come thank you thank you Mr. Tajadin thank you Eleanor um, I think the areas that most uh, that concern our community the most is um, are the areas are housing, jobs, education, and crime. I've clearly uh, have been the front runner in doing things in these areas very successfully. I was very involved in the 125th Street rezoning, the Columbia expansion plan, and I gained major benefits for our, the 9th Council District. Uh, in education, I was the forerunner in slowing down charter school invasions uh, with crime. Instead of talking about crime and stop and frisk, I came up with a solution uh, that could slow it down. And in our communities, 
uh, it has slowed down. So I think with that track record of doing all these things without being elected or holding a public office, I think that uh, it's time that I take this seat and I could do much more. So on September 12th, I'm asking for your vote. Vote for someone who has a proven track record of doing things. Vote for Julius Tajuddin. I want to thank all the candidates for being here today and participating in today's debate. The primary elections will be held on Tuesday, September 12th. For more information about voting, locating your poll site, and the candidates, you can visit the League of Women Voters website, lwvnyc.org. Please remember, only voters enrolled in a political party having a primary may vote in the primary election on September 12th. Thank you for watching Race to Represent on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Goodbye.